Hey, buckaroos and buckarettes. It's good to be back with you. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how to figure out the components of a force in three dimensions. When we do statics problems, we usually start out in two dimensions because it makes the math a little easier, but it keeps the part of the problem that's interesting. So eventually we have to go to three dimensions, and this is what that looks like. So let's start by looking just at the forces. Now it took me a couple of tries to get this, but I drew a force in red, and I drew this box around it so you can see where the components are. Now I've got the, the coordinates written in x in the horizontal direction, y in the vertical direction, and z kind of coming out of the board. Now why did I do it that way? Well, I wanted this to be a uh, right-handed coordinate system. And so right-handed, take your right hand, grab the x vector, rotate it into the y vector, z is your thumb. Now there's not many advantages to being uh, left-handed, but I can do this with one hand and still be able to write with the other. So x into y, z goes out that way. So I've got a right-handed coordinate system. Now I drew this box and I gave it some, some dimensions here, or some, some relative sizes. They're not actually dimensions, because I've got the force equal to a thousand newtons, and I've got uh, two units this way, three units in, uh, two units in the x direction, I should say, three units in the z direction, and six in the y direction. So how do we deal with this? Um, if you start trying to calculate angles in here, you're going to find out pretty quick that there are so many angles, you're going to start getting, getting confused. So we're going to do this two ways. One is we're going to use what are called unit vectors, and the other one is we're going to use cosine angles. So let's start with unit vectors first. Now the unit vector is kind of a weird thing when you first look at it. It has a unit uh, length, that means it has a length of one, but it has a direction. So if you multiply a scalar by a unit vector, all you did was gave it a direction. It didn't change its magnitude. Here's what the unit vectors look like. Yeah, let's maybe do this in green here. So unit vectors. Okay, I've got a coordinate system here that looks just like the one I was using a minute ago. And so this is x, y, and z. But unit vectors in those directions are i, and that little caret over it, that little sort of hat. That means it's a vector. It's not a scalar anymore. It has magnitude and direction. Its magnitude is 1, and its direction is in the x direction. y, j, okay, j hat, that little caret up there, means j, the j unit vector has a magnitude of 1 and points upwards. This one points horizontals, and this is i and j. You can pretty much guess this one is going to be k. So the unit vector for that is k, has a magnitude of 1, and it points out this way. So what unit vectors do, the big idea here is they take scalars and they give them directions without changing their magnitude. That's why it's called a unit vector. So let's see here. If I wanted to write out a unit vector based on that 2, 3, and 6, what would that look like? Well. Let's get started. Okay, if I can erase this. So my force is 2 in the x direction. So 2i plus 6j plus 3k. Well, not quite. Those give me the relative components, the relative directions, but they, the magnitudes aren't right, because there's a, there, these, the, the sum total of these doesn't add up to a thousand when I apply the uh, Pythagorean theorem. So let's fix that. Let's do this. Let's give, let's multiply these by a constant. And we don't know what that constant is, but we're going to figure it out here in a second. So 2i, 6j, 3k. The, that's a vector expression now. And there's no way to simplify this. This is it. This is as simple as it gets. There's no way to reduce it to anything more basic than this. All right? Well, what happens if we, uh, let's expand that out a little bit. So, let's see, here we go. 2ci plus 6cj 
plus 3c k. All right, there it is. That, that's, I, I put the c inside of it now. That's a bad c. Let me see if I can get rid of that. There. Now, the, I know the magnitude of it is 1,000, so let's see. The, the magnitude of a vector is, we figured that out using the Pythagorean theorem. Now, we're usually taught the Pythagorean theorem in two dimensions, but it works in any dimension, any number of dimensions. It certainly works in three dimensions. So let's do this. Okay, that's going to be 4c squared plus 36c squared plus 9c squared. Okay, and that's just bring the c back out. 4 plus 36 plus 9. Looks like that's c times the square root of 49. All right? That's the magnitude. Well, that also happens to be a thousand because that right there has to equal that right there. So if you solve that for C, you get 142.857. 142.57. Let's make sure you can see that. Okay, you can see that. So 142.857, that's what C is. So if we plug C back in there, can I, can I erase this stuff here? Got as much of that as you want? Okay. Let's, uh, I have to use my, my cheat sheet here. There's no way I was going to remember this. Since we know C now, that turns out to be 285. Okay, there it is in, in uh, vector form with i, j, and k. And just when you, if you double check, if you go out and, and figure out the magnitude of that, it really is a thousand. So there's one way to do it. This is with unit vectors. All right. I'm going to ask the blackboard fairy to uh, clean this up a little bit. And then we're going to do something with uh, what's called cosine angles. Okay, the next thing we're going to do here is look at this the other way, using something called cosine angles. Now, the big idea here is that we're going to look, we're going to be able to express f of x as f cosine theta x. like that. All right, now we already know what these are. We already figured them out. This is the i, j, and k components. So what are these angles? We know what this is. That's given. That's a thousand. So what are theta x, theta y, and theta z? Well, there's lots of different angles we could define here, but the one we're interested in right now is the one that goes from the vector itself to an axis. So let's see if I can do this here. That one which goes from that vector to the x-axis. Now, it isn't in line with either the xy, the xz, or the yz plane. It's at some other angle. But that angle is defined by that coordinate axis right there and this line right here. That's theta x. Okay, and so it's actually a little bit of an angle here on this drawing. Now, if there's a theta x, there must be a theta y and a theta z, and there are. So theta y is the angle that goes from the vector to theta y, or to the y-axis, I should say. And guess what theta z is? Theta z goes from the vector to the z-axis. So there you go. Those are, those are called cosine angles. That's what the picture looks like. All right, we already know what they are from the beginning of this problem. And just to make sure we, we're, everybody's on board here, This is what it would look like. There. So components defined by that, let me get back in the picture here, I guess. 
components defined is right there, and then directions, okay, in uh, unit vectors in the x, y, and z directions. So there it is in a nutshell. There's uh, uh, how to decompose forces in three dimensions. Hope this helps, and we'll talk to you next time.